Welcome everyone to Women in Work's eighth live author Q&A as part of our Women in Work book club. We're so excited to be here with you tonight. I'm Courtney Powell. I'm the Director of Ministry Content for Women in Work, and I am joined by Courtney Moore, the founder and president. And we are so excited to welcome Drs. Richard Langer and Joanne Jung tonight as we discuss their book. It's called The Call to Follow. This is what it looks like. The Call to Follow, Hearing Jesus in a Culture Obsessed with Leadership. So welcome, you two. We're really excited for this conversation. Thank you. Um, and welcome to all of you joining us on um, YouTube Live or on Facebook. If there are any questions that you have that you would like to submit, you can just enter those and we will uh, figure out a way to get those to Rick and Joanne and we will get uh, answers to you um, after this conversation. And so um, we're really excited for you guys to get to hear from Rick and Joanne. Well, thank you. Rick and Joanne, it's just been such... <laughs> yes, absolutely. Welcome, welcome. Um, before we jump into talking about your book, which Courtney and I both um, just love, we love the whole concept of it, I really wanted to take a minute and just share with our viewers and our listeners, if you're listening to this later on the podcast, just a little bit about who you guys are, and then um, you guys can share a little bit more um, if you would like. So we have um, Joanne Jung. You, she was born and raised in Los Angeles, California. After years as a stay-at-home mom, her return to academia earned her a master's in Bible exposition from Talbot School of Theology, and while teaching undergraduates at Biola, a PhD from Fuller Theological Seminary. As full professor, she teaches biblical interpretation and spiritual formation classes and is the associate dean of online education and faculty development at Talbot. Joanne and her husband, Norm, are privileged to have four adult children, two sons in love, and five grandchildren, all of whom are some of her favorite friends. That's so sweet. <laughs> Joanne, we can't wait to get to know you more. Thank you, Courtney. And then we have Rick, who is a professor of biblical studies and theology and the director of the Office of Faith and Learning at Biola University. He specializes in the integration of faith and learning and has also published in the areas of bioethics, theology, and philosophy. He has a passion for helping Christians of all ages understand the connection between the gospel and all the diverse facets of the created order in which we live. Sounds honestly super fascinating. So prior coming to Viola, he served for over 20 years as a pastor at Trini Trinity Evangelical Free Church in Redlands, California. Friends, it's so such an honor to have you guys with us tonight. It's been such a pleasure to read your work and honestly be the beneficiaries of just, I'm sure, a labor of love for you. You guys did a ton of research and put the work in. And honestly, it was just such a blessing for us to to receive uh, the efforts of your labor. So, And then we're just delighted to have you with us tonight. So thanks for joining us. You bet. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Yeah. One of the kind of first things that we like to ask and that I'm really interested to hear from the both of you on is, well, first of all, if there's anything else you would like to share with us about your yourself, your family or anything like that, um, please feel free to do so. But we would love to know what inspired the two of you to write the book. Uh, we, you know, did you see a need that you were filling or is it a topic that you've always been passionate about? We would just love to hear from you guys. Like what compelled you to write this? Oh, gosh. Rick, where do we begin? Um, uh, I will start with, uh, I, I think this is how it began, because sometimes in these processes, uh, we don't know the exact beginning, but um, I call them theological jam sessions. Uh, Rick's office is on the third floor. My office is on the second floor. And uh, oftentimes when we're in our offices, we get out and we walk the hallways and we have these theological jam sessions. And we would. We would have them in our offices and we'd talk about uh, what the English Puritans are were doing, and Rick would tell me a little bit more about the integration seminars that um, he houses and uh, holds um, on campus. Um, and uh, and we just we were talking about um, leaders and leadership, and one thing led to another, and soon it became there's so much focus on leadership, but what about discipleship? What about being a follower of Christ, Rick? Yeah, and as as you guys mentioned, it's a little hard to even identify when it began because we ended up having kind of a running conversation about this for, I don't know, maybe four or five years. I mean, it was a long time that we would 
you know, see each other, talk about it. We'd have some thought and we'd, you know, chat about it. And so uh, finally, we just both had a moment. We'd both worked on other projects and suddenly had a, a time that we could both work on something together. And we thought, well, let's just do it. So we mm. we did. But it was born, I think your point about a, a felt need. Mm. I, I really did feel like there was something funky about American culture on this point mm. relative to leadership and followership. And so, yeah, it was born out of that sense of need. Something needs to be said kind of a feeling. So, yeah, that was a big, yeah. a big part of it. And I think what's what's funny about that is once we started um, ha having that lens, we started seeing more. We started seeing even a greater emphasis on leadership. You know, in our book, it, we talk about Girl Scout cookies. We talk about car um, <laughs> advertisements and things. And wow, all of a sudden, everyone is supposed to be a leader. And that's your calling, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I still you remember really Joanne. I, just, I still remember Joanne telling me about the Girl Scout cookies and I just, I just <laughs> couldn't help but laugh. It was just nuts. So yes, Courtney, back to you. And so, yeah. Just for our uh, listeners who maybe have not read the book yet, tell us about those Girl Scout cookies because you, they had messages <laughs> on them and yes. one was about leadership, right? Yes. Um, they're, they're called lemon ups. I don't think they came out in this year's menu, but uh -huh. um, they were called Lemon Ups and they were stamped with four different messages. One of the messages was, I am a leader. Hmm. So, you, so they're selling these Girl Scout cookies. And what are we supposed to do with these? Like, yes, I am a leader and consume a cookie, you know? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> well, and then you kind of talk about the absurdity of you would never see a Girl Scout cookie that said, I am a follower. Right, <laughs> right. Well, right. Um, yeah. We just, I mean, yeah, we don't hear that message. They, they would pull the ripcord and shut down the operation if you're teaching your kids to be followers. <laughs> it's just like, you, you can't do that. No, All right. So really how would you guys define, and you kind of talk about how it is actually difficult for many people to define followership, but if you could give mm -hmm. sort of your elevator pitch of what, what does it mean to be a follower? What is followership? And why is this so important, especially for Christians to, to cultivate? Yeah. Um, in the book, we reference um, characteristics of, of a good follower, <clears throat> certainly uh, the deference, deference uh, toward um, our leaders and certainly the zeal and the zeal toward engagement in a mission, but also that mission ownership. Um, that's really key. Um, what what are we um, what are we a part of that then we become um uh, engaged followers, engaged uh, employees, engaged parents, engaged yeah. um, Christians in these um, various aspects of our, of our lives. Um, and I know Rico will bring this up as well, but even biblically, you know, we, what we hear is, uh, well done, my good and faithful servant, mm. uh, not well done, my good and faithful leader. Right. So, so we, we brought it back to scripture and brought it back to um, uh, what does Jesus say? And what is uh, Paul saying in the epistles? Um, what is God saying about uh, a follower and how he elevates being a follower um, and that we never stop following? Even as uh, we may be given leadership roles, we never stop being a follower. And the key is, are we a, a good and faithful follower? Mm -hmm. And I think that was one of the things that hit us as we were talking about this is kind of the biblical perspective. One of the things that happened early on, we were, Joanna, this is probably before we were even writing the book, but we were chatting about things and um, just making the comment, I think someone had rent, sent Joanne something, I can't remember what it was, but they just made the comment in there that uh, the way they put it was that uh, actually servant leadership isn't even a biblical concept. And I, mm. I, I might actually disagree with that, but the thing that hit me was where I get servant leadership, it doesn't talk about servant leadership. So we, we associate this with Jesus and the upper room discourse and he takes off his clothes and he wipes his feet and, you know, you know, the, the Gentiles, people lorded over each other is not supposed to be among you, but the one who's greatest among you is the one who's going to be, and we read it as if Jesus said the servant leader among you. But yeah. he just says servant. Yes. And you right. see yeah. you see that. And I just realized, wow, I 
I read that leadership thing into that phrase for 50 years. And I'm just like, wow, I am so programmed to think and hear anything that's being praised must be leadership and not followership. And then, as Joanne mentioned before, you begin to see it everywhere and you're thinking, man, wait a minute. Paul says, in effect, follow me as I follow Christ. And then you see Jesus basically describes himself as a follower of the Father. He doesn't come up with what he teaches. He just passes on what the Father teaches. He doesn't come up with a schedule. He just comes when the Father sends him. He doesn't yeah. do all of the things, you know, you're, you're not obeying him. You're obeying the Father who he's obeying. And you have this whole cascade of self-descriptions of Jesus yeah. modeling for us what does it mean to look to the Father to follow him, Paul follows Jesus. Timothy follows Paul. We just have this great cascade of followership that we've mm-hmm. somehow turned into a cascade of leadership. We have the whole thing kind of screwed on backwards. Yeah. Mm. I thought that section was so encouraging because it's so interesting. People would look at me and think, okay, well, she's a leader, right? She's leading this organization. But the idea to me of leadership is so intimidating because you feel like, oh my gosh, I am a good leader or I'm a bad leader. But what you just described is kind of this line you say in the book of where you look back and you see follower after follower after follower. And as believers, you know, we're all following Christ. To me, that just takes so much pressure off of, you know, if you've been called to lead, it's like, okay, well, am I just following Christ? Like that's number one, you know? Yeah. So to me, that was just really, really encouraging. Um, I also loved in the book when you guys talked about the difference between a leader centered type of mm-hmm. uh, role, you know, or yeah. a mission centered role. And I, I know I we've probably all been in um, jobs or even in volunteer positions or church type situations where um, there's just like you're you're doing what you are supposed to do because your leader told you to do it. And, you know, there are repercussions to having that mindset, that leader centered mindset versus the mission centered mindset. Can you guys talk about like how a good follower, how being on mission really affects how you follow? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think one of the things is, is a sense of zeal and passion for the, the mission that you're saying, wow, I'm on mission. I'm, I'm here for a reason. I'm not just here. I'm here for a purpose that I own. And I realized that the best way to pursue that purpose was in conjunction with other people. There's a person Mm -hmm. here who's, you know, coordinating an organization and leading it in the direction that I can join in and put my efforts in there. So that's all great. But you have an absolutely clear vision of this. I I just happened to get a, a text message from a friend saying, hey, do you want to go climb Mount Kilimanjaro? (laughs) <laughs> now, I'm kind of like, I'm sort of in for that. I'm hoping this will work out. I have no idea if it will or not. But imagine I hop on an airplane and fly to Africa. And uh, he said, you know, we were going to go climb first and then our wives might fly over and we could go on a safari or something and all this. And said, so, oh, that sounds, you know, this sounds, wow, I'm, I'm all in. But imagine I show up there in Nairobi and, uh, you know, the guy who's supposed to be taking me on this mountain climb says, okay, well, here's your night goggles so you can see all the animals at the watering hole. And here's the sleeping bag that you have as we are up there in the loft. And then hop in the Jeep because it'll take us to where we're going. And I'm like, no, I, I'm here to climb a mountain. And you're mm-hmm. giving me safari instructions. I'm here to be a follower. I'm not planning on finding my own way to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. you're you're taking me to the safari. And I'm here to climb the mountain. Uh, we got a problem here. And so yeah. I can't choose my guide unless I know my mission, right? Mm. So, yeah, you know, I, I have no no need to be the leader to get up that mountain, but I better know the fact that I'm there to climb a mountain or am I there for a safari or am I there to go preach in a church? I mm. it could be any of the above, but I better know which or I'm not going to have a good trip. Yeah, that's a great example, honestly. That's a really good example. Well, and I love, too, in that section of the book, when you say, you know, if you are mission-centered, you really can own it and then use your own personal gifts. You know, you are, you recognize, okay, this is, I'm here because God put me here. And what gifts can I contribute to this? Not just like, let me just follow the example. Let let me just do what my boss is telling me to do. You know, to me, that's really huge. Mm -hmm. And something I hope our, uh, the women in work community, um, 
fills that themselves, you know, like whatever role they're in, whatever job they're in, they really are called there by the Lord and can say, I'm going to own this mission. I'm going to, I'm going to be a part of it, submit to, you know, what I'm in and demonstrate, um, you know, some of the gifts the Lord has given me in it. You know, that's Courtney, that's so critical because um, what, what you are describing and what we described in the book is our dependence on God, our dependence on the Holy Spirit to show us, because oftentimes we don't know and we're confused about uh, the the workplace environment or the people that we're engaged with or our fellow employees. And, we, and we're not sure and we don't know. But that dependence on God's spirit is, okay, Lord, show me how you want to use me with the gifts and the roles that you've given me. Mm-hmm. And he will show us uh, because that's what he wants to do, uh, to maximize on our own personal spiritual growth. Um, he's going to to speak into that. Uh, for us and with us, we just have to be so in tune to hear him. Hmm. Yeah. I love that. Well, one of the things that I, at this imagery that I think is almost, it was really illuminating for me when reading the book is there was this illustration about a line. And I think a lot of the times when we're thinking about following or like followership, we don't think about it as a line. We think about it as a pyramid and you have this person at the top and then being a follower is you're automatically underneath. But when you realize that Jesus is following, you know, he's, he's following the will of the father that it's, it's more of an ordered uh, structure instead of hierarchical. Right. And so like you, the illustration in the book talks about this line and that when people are following in a line, there's a leader. And a lot of times, you know, you could be really far back from the leader even, and um, not, not see them, but you're continuing to follow and follow and follow, which is a good thing. But I love that imagery of a line that it's not that being a follower means that you're less than, you know, it's not that your, your value is less. Um, it, it has to do with the order. And I thought yeah. that was really, um, I thought that was really compelling. It's helpful to think about that way, that's not the language around being a follower that we have in our culture. Being a follower is seen as less than, it's seen as, you talk about this a lot in the book, but it's almost seen as you're failing. If you're following, it's because you're a failed leader. Um, and that's not true. That's It's not true. Um, and anyone that's been in an organization knows what a gift it is to have really good followers, people that will champion you and come alongside you and um, in, in leadership. I wanted to, t- to drill in a little bit more, Joanne, you just mentioned this, but I wanted to drill down even more into the marketplace because, you know, for women in work, a lot of the women that our community, that make up our community are in the market marketplace. And so we talk a lot about this commitment to mission and one of our, you know, our vision statement is we want to see women confidently step into their calling. We want them to view their work as meaningful to God's kingdom. And we believe that our overall mission as believers is the advancement of God's kingdom, right? Um, But I would love to hear some practical wisdom from you for women and men that maybe they're in positions in the marketplace where they're, maybe they're, they're in a bad leadership structure, or maybe they're not in a place where they can make effective change. Is there a way to follow well in these scenarios? Like maybe you're working at, I'm just thinking retail, you know, you're working a retail job and maybe your boss isn't that great. Is there a way to be a good follower, a healthy follower in these scenarios? Yes. (laughs) <laughs> tell me more Julian, tell me more. Um, Courtney you, you've you've mentioned a, a couple of things and so a, a number of thoughts are uh, swimming around in my head so I'm hoping to address um, a, at least a, a couple of them one is when it comes to God and his kingdom the ultimate the it will always be about people mm-hmm. and yes we we are part of an organization we um and, and we adopt the values of an organization and, and our mission, uh, but it will always involve people. And so where are we located in our workplaces? Um, with whom has God ordained mm-hmm. us to engage with? Now, granted, uh, hopefully there are people that we get along well with. Undoubtedly, there'll be people that we don't get along with. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the critical part because if God's kingdom is all about people, then God, how are you going to use me in this challenging situation? Um, 
I'm going to take it to an extreme because there are sometimes that we say, oh, I can't stand working with this person. Uh, we even use the, the hate word, you know, I hate working with this person. Um, and and I, I wrote somewhere else on this, but I, I want to keep bringing it up because when we start seeing, and again, depending on uh, dependence on God, when we start seeing people as made in the image of God, and I've wrestled with this too, I would actually envision a caption under somebody that I either think about or I see, and that caption simply says, made in the image of God, mm -hmm. or made in my image, says God. And mm -hmm. I, I, you know what? It changes my heart and my heart attitude every single time. Oh yeah, God, that's right. Mm -hmm. That person is made in your image. So my responsibility is then, how do I respond to that person made in your image? Mm -hmm. um, that person may do hurtful things, but how will I respond giving evidence that the spirit resides in me? Mm -hmm. And so it will always be that one-on-one -on -one kind of relationship, that person, whether again, we get along with that person well, um, or, or we don't. So that will bear witness of God's kingdom uh, reign in us. Yeah, that's really good. That's really helpful. There's a, uh, we, we put a study guide in the back of the book. That's, it's partly a discussion guide. It, like most things in life, I'm a fan of doing them together with other people. You, usually it all works better, but this is one of those guides that isn't just sit down and talk about what's in there. It's like, really think about what is your mission relative to fill in the blank. And one of the things we describe, this is an idea from, uh, from Martin Luther about calling is that we tend to equate calling with our job. And Martin Luther says, no, your calling is your situation in life. And that includes your job. It includes your family. Mm -hmm. It includes your community. It includes your extent. And you can make a list of your set of what we might call a set of callings, plural, hmm. And part of what we really want to do is say in each and every one of those, just picking up on the thread of exactly what Joanne was sharing, in each and every one of these callings, what is it that God has for me? What, hmm. what is it that's meaningful there? And let me maximize that. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, kind of that attitude. And so there's a fair number of kind of questions in the book that help people process that. And, and one thing I would kind of highlight just as an example of this, um, it's a it's a concept called job crafting, and it's uh, we mention this in the book. It comes up in there, and it came from a study that a couple of uh, women who were faculty at, I think, uh, University of Pennsylvania at the time. Anyhow, some university was doing some study on this, and they were evaluating people and how you know jobs didn't didn't work and. Uh, they were interviewing people at a hospital who were custodians, what we would call custodians. Mm -hmm. And there was a batch of people who found it really rewarding, really significant, blah, blah, blah. There's a batch of people who didn't. They began to figure out what's the deal. And they start talking to the person who's like, oh, yeah, my job is to heal people because I work at mm -hmm. a hospital. But you're the janitor. Says, so, oh yeah, I know. So I structure my job so I find out who doesn't have extended family who visits them and things like that. I do them last because if I do the rest of the job fast enough, I can have extra time to be in the room with them, find needs that they have. And you realize, oh, this person who's quote merely a custodian latched onto the mission of the hospital with mm. a zeal. And they're like, wow. I am not cleaning floors, I'm healing people. And my particular contribution to that will actually be partly relational talking to them. But then I find out, oh, this person really loves art. And there's not a, a single art thing in this entire hospital room. By golly, I need to cure that. So they go out and they find something. You know, they're the janitor. They know where all this stuff is. And they'll just do those kinds of things. And it was just mm -hmm. transformative for the patients, for the person who's doing it. It advances the mission of the hospital. Everybody wins. And it's all because a follower, you might say, simply owned the mission as opposed to simply did their job. And that is a thing I think is almost always available. Our, our boss may or may not ever think of that. I, you know, yeah, sometimes sure. you have bosses with no imagination. Help them out. Have an imagination. <laughs> oh, man, that's really good. Well, OK, Rick, 
I'll throw this one to you first, and then I'd love to hear your answer to this as well, Joanne. But um, I mean, I think the reality for so many of us in the work workplace is probably a lack of imagination, like what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, what if you're actually not that passionate about your organization's mission? You know, like, what does that look like? Is, is it what you're describing where you just have a bigger imagination of how you view your work and contribution? Because we know all work is valuable, right? All yeah. Everything that you do is a way that you can honor the Lord. But what, you know, if you're wanting to, if the, if the concept of being a good follower is buying into the mission, how do you help people? How do you cast a vision for a mission that maybe, maybe the actual organization doesn't have a mission that you're that, that you care that much about? <laughs> what would you say to someone in that situation? I would love to hear your answer to that. Well, so there's a couple things to come to mind. It would be good for Joanne to talk about this as well, but, um, so number one is that sometimes that is an indicator you should be looking at somewhere else to work. You know, sometimes there's, you know what, this just, this job isn't me. I have no passion yeah. for this. And, you know, I'm like, okay, well, no harm, no foul. There's nothing wrong with saying that's an indicator that I need to go and find a place uh, that I have more mission for. But a second mm -hmm. thing I'd point out is that sometimes back to that issue of callings, not just a calling. Mm -hmm. sometimes your job won't be your biggest source of meaning in life. And I remember talking to a friend of mine. Uh, in fact, we were friends over a long, long period of time. And early in our friendship, I think, I don't know if they'd even had children yet, but we were having a Bible study group. We kind of broke up, had one of these wonderful long conversations. Well, what legacy do we want to have? And his wife came from a dysfunctional, alcoholic kind of dysfunctional home. He He did too. He said, you know, my legacy is simply to break the chain. Mm -hmm. We have chained four generations back of alcohol and addiction. And if my wife and I can break the chain, that we couldn't leave a better legacy. And I thought, wow, that's great. Well, fast forward 25 years and he's having uh, a job that isn't really fulfilling. And we started talking through all the other facets in his life. And he had a, a special needs daughter. It was not an easy situation in terms of those kinds of things. And so the church that we're in had a great program for special needs people. He had a bunch of other things going on. And he, he started to do this assessment. He realized, you know, the only thing in his life that was really not so great at that moment was his job. Mm -hmm. And he thought, you know what? That's not a bad deal, is it? And so, you know what? He just persevered in the job and he made the most of it. You know, you can do all the job kind of things we talked about. You You can do those things. But... Part of the realization for him was just saying, you know, there's a lot of other things in my life and this job mm -hmm. is making it possible for my wife not to work because it paid well. It makes it easier for her than to care for their daughter. It allowed mm -hmm. all kinds of benefits for them and said, you know what, if I go chasing after two more meaning points on my personal job and all the rest of the family loses 10, I'm actually mm -hmm. violating my calling because my first calling is mm -hmm. break the chain, man. I'm not mm -hmm. going to pass on a legacy of one more generation of broken families and dysfunctional things with alcoholics and all the other stuff that had gone on. Wow. So that's always served as kind of this thing that reminds me of, you know, sometimes we're over worried about my job has to be the source of meaning. It's another way we kind of buy into an American expectation that I think is a bit, you know, problematic. Not that jobs aren't mm. good. They just they aren't the only good. Yeah, you're right. Oh, that's yeah. good. Yeah. Joanne, what would you say to that? The I, answer well, that I, I totally agree with Rick. So much of it is perspective. And again, we focus so much on our calling must be equated with our jobs. And so therefore, I, I need to pour into the job. But, um, but being a Christ follower, our callings involve everything we do in life. And I, I remember talking to Rick about the book and we, and, I, and we were talking about this book is not just for uh, followers who are leading. This book is for that single mom who has to work mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to provide for her children. Um, this book is for just a, a wide variety of people. In fact, Courtney, we came into the same, this, this book is for all Christians uh, because it helps us perceive the um, a better perspective, a, a God's kingdom perspective on things, whether it be people or our jobs or our volunteer work or our ministries. It's giving that um, that followership perspective to every aspect of our lives, not just our, our workplaces and not mm. just the, 
the people that we work alongside with or our, our bosses or, you know, fellow managers or, or things like that. Mm-hmm. So uh, a lot of it is, um, is perspective. And where mm-hmm. are we going to get that perspective? It's going to come back then to our relationship with God. It comes back to our relationship. You know, how attuned are we to God's spirit, um, you know, in these situations? Mm-hmm. Well, and one of my favorite chapters in the book, Joanne, uh, I believe it was a chapter you wrote about really sort of the things that help us become good followers as Christians. And you kind of go through uh, some of the, you know, spiritual disciplines there. Um I'd love to hear you kind of just talk about some of those disciplines and, and each one you kind of go through. I can't remember exactly what chapter this is. I'm trying to find, oh, it's chapter. Um, it's the rhythms one, right? I think it's chapter, chapter seven. seven. Chapter, chapter seven. seven. And I even just love, yeah. you don't even call it spiritual disciplines. You call it soul rhythms for faithful <laughs> following. Yeah. And I, I love even that. love the way you described uh, rhythms in yeah. there, how it's almost melodic where I mean, can you talk about that and 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 even how it as you you kind of display one of the rhythms and then I love how you just invite people in. You're invited uh-huh. to you know know the Lord's presence in prayer, or you're invited to. Um, I'd love to just hear you kind of your heart about that chapter in general, and if there's anything specific you'd love to share, um, we can yeah. chat about it. Well, uh, do you have another hour? I know. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'm going to back up a little bit. Um, The reason why we chose the word soul is because scripturally, biblically, the soul is body and spirit. Sometimes uh, for different disciplines, uh, we like to separate them. Um, But biblically, if you look at uh, in Genesis, the soul is body and spirit. So we're looking at the soul rhythms as a complete person what we think, but also our, our physical beings. Um, and so soul rhythms involve not just, you know, meditating and just, uh, just prayer, but how about our, our physical presence uh, with things? So, it, so we focused on all of that together. Um, I think primarily I, I liked focusing on silence and solitude. You know, it's so funny that research, scientific research is, is catching up with so many things uh, that the Bible already knew, that, that God already knew in scripture. And so when we talk about silence and solitude, so much happens in silence and solitude. We think, um, you know, when I when my students go on a three-hour silence and solitude time, they're thinking, oh my, I, do you know how much I can do in three hours? Do you know mm-hmm. how, how many assignments I can finish, how many books I can read, how many papers I can write? Um, and they go for the three hours, they go in kind of complaining. And afterward, I ask them, So how about if I change it to one hour? Hands down, the response is, no, 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 no. You have to keep it at three hours because that first hour, there are too many voices competing for my attention. So what happens in this silence and solitude is we actually become comfortable with our own voice. We Mm. actually become more comfortable with God's voice and his silences. Mm. So sometimes we'll see couples um, enjoying a meal and they're not talking all the time but they're enjoying one another's presence. Hmm. And so silence and solitude brings that. Um, and again, some of this research is finding uh, creativity is heightened in silence and solitude. Yeah. And we think it's a waste of time, right? Because I could be mm-hmm. doing so much more. Uh, but we find that we, we come up with more creative ideas, more creative solutions um, in, in times with, um, in silence and solitude. And it is growing familiar and comfortable in the presence of God. Mm-hmm. Um, this was this is kind of a, a, a mic drop moment with my students. I would say, why would you want to spend an eternity with God if we find it so difficult to spend three hours with Him? Mm, yeah. And they go, whoa, okay, <laughs> we'll, do, we'll do this. Right. Um, but but then they they reap the benefits of spending silence and solitude in the presence of God. Yeah. That's so good. I was just, I am in this season of life where I have littles, you know, little people living in our house. I have six of four and a four year old and a newborn. And you really, yeah, you really appreciate 
silence when you're surrounded <laughs> when you're in a house full of noise you'd give um, anything for three hours of silence right <laughs> I like i can't even offer him that um that, no i love that i and one of the things you said in the book too is as you get these really practical you know when you're looking at this giant you're looking at this list of different rhythms it can be overwhelming but you give these just really easy on ramps even even silence and solitude it's like you don't have to start with three hours sometimes right. it's 10 minutes, you know, whatever it may be, what, what you have. Um, I thought that was just really, really helpful. I love hearing you talk about, I love hearing you talk about well, that. Um, um, one time a woman came up to me and said, you know, I don't, I don't have time. This is an adult student. I don't have time for science and solitude. Um, I, you know, I work, I go to school, uh, I've, I've got kids. And so I asked her, um, what's the very first thing you do when you get into your car? She said, well, I start my engine. And I said, okay, what's the second thing you do? And she said, I turn on the radio. And I said, there you go. That's right. There you go. Because well, it has become such a habit of ours just to turn these things on. Mm -hmm. um, and it was it was like a light bulb came on. And she thought, oh, there it is. Yeah. With or without children, turn the radio off. Turn the, you know, turn our devices off. Focus on being present. With or with children there, be present. Be present with them. Um, when you're waiting to pick up a child at a sporting event or a practice, you've got those 10 minutes in the car. Don't turn the radio on. Don't go yeah. to your devices. Don't check Facebook, mm. but be present. Yeah. So we need to learn how to seize those moments because God gives them to us all the time. And Joanne, you even mentioned in the book, standing in the grocery line, sometimes you will oh. choose to take the longest line so you can just stand there and commune with Jesus in the grocery store. Yeah. I was like, wow, that, this one that is, is really great. That is downright un-American, Joanne. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, don't, I can't count the number of, of little tug of cart wars that, that I have between myself and uh, someone who certainly wants to get me through the express line, right? <laughs> I, I'm fine right here. So, but yeah. Joe, that is one other thing I was thinking um, that I, it was just a short little thing you mentioned in this chapter, but when you talk about um, not missing time in the word and you said that you tell yourself, he has something for me. And I yeah. thought, gosh, you know, just when you were trying to decide, should I hit the snooze or should I go uh, meet with the Lord and just believing and telling yourself, no, he has something for me mm -hmm. and how he yes. always does. I thought that was yeah. really encouraging and just a simple, just little nugget to put in your, in your head to renew your mind with that truth of, no, I've got to seek him. I don't want to miss what he has for me. And then that's going to yes. fuel you for the day of all of those callings that the Lord's put in front of you uh, for the day. Yeah. I thought that was good. Yeah, we uh, we we talked a little bit about this in the intro, and I I want to bring it back up for the recorded part of the conversation because I just think it's really valuable. You guys talking about all these ways of which you know you're you're practicing these rhythms. We were talking about earlier on in the book. I think it's chapter four or five, talking about Brother Lawrence. We were talking about the book, um, practicing the presence of God. I think that's what it's called, mm -hmm. and. Yeah. Um, I would love for you guys to, to kind of just tell his story. I think that his story, the story of Brother Lawrence and the way that he honored the Lord in the most mundane things. And, and it's like exactly what you're describing, Joanne, even in the grocery store, he found ways to practice the presence of God in his ordinary life. And one of the kind of things, even in that chapter, I think it's in the same chapter that you guys talk about is a lot of the times it feels like to be used by God, we have to do something extraordinary, but it's actually that yeah. God does extraordinary things through our ordinary acts yes. of obedience. And I loved that. So I, I'm not sure which one of you wrote about Brother Lawrence, but I would love to hear you kind of share just a little more of, of that story and kind of how that came to your mind when you were thinking about this, the, about followership. Yeah. So that, that example of Brother Lawrence is really, it was pretty powerful to me because I'm a fan of Brother Lawrence, love the book. Um, I, you know, I, he isn't like my idol or something, but it's like, man, I, I have to admit the thought, wouldn't it be cool to write a book that would go through 457 different editions, be in print 400 years after I'm gone? I'm thinking, yeah, that's a major two thumbs right. up. You know, I am like <laughs> all in on this. And then you find out that, you know, this guy, he, 
you know, we think of him as being a monastic and he kind of was, but he was what's called a lay brother, which just means you're the guy who works in the monastery so the monks can do the important stuff. Because you're cooking in the kitchen, they don't have to, and they can pray, they can transcribe things, they can, you know, record manuscripts, they can do all those good spiritual activities. And you, my good man, are the one who's by his efforts allows them to do all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Brother Lawrence, the way we tell the story in the book, we're talking about Nicholas Herman because that was his name, but we know him now as, uh, you know, Brother Lawrence, Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection was the name he took on when he went into the uh, to monastery. But he li- literally was, he was just like, that's fine. No problem. I'll work mm-hmm. in the kitchen. He didn't mm-hmm. like the kitchen. He wasn't good at the kitchen. He had a lame leg. So he's out there, you know, the one of the stories he tells is about getting all this, these casks of wine that they pack in these little tiny boats because they're going up and down these small rivers. So they pack it all up and then the guy can't walk effectively. So he has to roll his own body over the mm-hmm. casts that are filling the boat to try and get the boat. To, and you just like, I'm listening or reading this account and I'm just like, Oh, please no, you know, mm-hmm. but he's just like, well, Hey, I made the most of it. God met me. We got the job done. It was all good. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of his, in all of his life is lived in the kitchen. It's not like he becomes famous one day, gets a trip down to Rome, the Pope, you know, does some sort of blessing, he becomes famous, never happens. And he dies never having written a word. Mm. But the way he lived in the kitchen drew all the other brothers in the monastery to him. And the, wow. the way he exuded this delight and joy in every moment of his life dazzled people. So they would ask him about that. And then people would get, correspondence and it'd write back. And so people collected all these things that he said and Mm. five or 10 years after he's gone, they just compile all these things and publish it. And the next thing you know, 400 years and 500 editions later, it's still in print. And Mm. the weirdest thing for me was asking myself the question, Rick, would you sign up Mm. to be brother Lawrence? If you knew that meant you would live and die without ever knowing what you did would actually become meaningful the way it did. Wow. And I'm like, is there like option C, uh, you know, some mm-hmm. other thing on this multiple choice quiz? Cause I, I kind of like the idea of all the achievements. So I, these are some of the things that kind of reveal things in your own heart that you're like, Oh, that's not what I was hoping to find when I looked inside. <laughs> Um, right. Well, I well love... it's like that the idea, sorry, it's, no. I was just going to say or piggyback on that. It's like this idea of, you know, even in, in parenting or there's so many examples like yeah. this, but if the the purpose of your work is is to see the fruit, a lot of the times your work is going to seem really meaningless <laughs> because a lot of the times you just don't see it the is. fruit right away. Yeah. Um, and he did not have a life where his, you know, he had abundant fruit in the sense of, but it wasn't tangible. You know, it was, it was the presence of God. That was the the fruit of his labor. But, um, yeah, I love that story. I think that's such a great example. I was just going to actually, yeah, no, I was just going to read a little quote, um, from this chapter. Um, Rick, you say, um, We feel guilty about our ordinary life. An ordinary life can be so easy and natural and comfortable that it doesn't seem quite right. Many of us, myself included, have a deep sense that we should aspire to something grand, demanding, challenging, or inspiring. It is not that I uh, want to be martyred, but I do want to be radical. I want to be completely sold out for Jesus. And then you go down and you continue to talk about Brother Lawrence and you say, he sanctified his kitchen and his kitchen sanctified him because he intentionally made Jesus present in everything he did. It was exactly because he embraced his ordinary calling as a divine calling that he was able to live his life so completely for the sake of Jesus. He was sold out for Jesus. So strangely enough, it didn't matter what he did. All that mattered was who he did it for. And then you give a, you give a quote of Bonhoeffer after that. But I mean, that was so powerful that, I mean, Mm -hmm. because I'm like you, I mean, he's just in there doing the dishes and it just doesn't seem very (laughs) much fun. We don't want to be the dishwasher. Um, But the Lord is there with us and it becomes actually, it's a, it's a meaningful task as we um, abide in him in that moment. Even like Mm. you, Joanne, standing in the grocery store line, um, Jesus is there with you. So it's really important. And one of the themes kind of, oh, go ahead. 
you know, it's really, I'm just going to add to that. What's really important is, is um, and I would say often, it's, uh, it's a question that Christians don't ask often enough. And that is, God, what is your perspective? Hmm. If I'm in the line at the grocery store yeah. and I see hmm. Anne uh, as a cashier, and she has a name tag, but people don't call her by her name. You know, they, I don't know why they ignore that, but, um, hmm. but God, what is your perspective? How do you see Anne? How can hmm. I engage with her? Hmm in a way that reflects um, your residing in me. Um, what is God's perspective? And in order to know that, we have to be in the word. You're right. where we get his perspective on people. We get his perspective on the world. Um, and to therefore be able to ask, uh, God, what is your perspective in this situation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another one of the things yeah. you, Courtney, did you want to follow up on that? Because I'll oh, yeah, shift the subject no, a tiny bit. Well, I was just going to, I was just going to say, Joanne, if you, for anyone listening that has read the book, the theme of the Holy Spirit is just so important throughout this whole idea. And even when you're talking, it just pours out of you. You can just tell that that is so important to you is that we, we allow the Holy Spirit to work through the word of God and to develop us and form us in, into Christ likeness. I love, and I, you know, in almost every question that you've answered, it comes back to just the Holy Spirit, honestly. Yeah. And I love that. I think that's really encouraging. You know, for the third person of the, of the Trinity, we oftentimes don't know what to do with him. Absolutely. You know, he shows up as fire, he shows up as love, you know. Um, and so do we pray to him? We can pray to God the Father, we can pray to God the Son, but do we pray to God the Holy Spirit? Um, so we don't quite know what to do with him. Yet, as the third person of the Trinity, he is the direct agent hmm. who is transforming us. Right. Yeah. So it would be most wise to stay connected with him. Right. Mm -hmm. He's the direct agent, he's doing the work of transforming us. I'd want to stay as attuned to him as possible. Mm. So, so when I ask God, is re God, what is your perspective in this celebration? God, what is your perspective in this dispute? Uh, what is your perspective? Let me sense that, or let me be silent enough mm. to hear you, whether it is to be silent or to be um, mindful of the choicest, gracious, impacting words to use hmm. not the quantity but the choice of words hmm. to use. yeah mm -hmm. that's good it's hard to follow that like, with words i'm like i'm like taking notes <laughs> are these going to be spirit powered no i love that joanne and you even give an example um talking about that in the book how you had a professor that in your job you you chose to really follow the spirit's lead on that. And it was such a better outcome than if you had just kind of gone in there and done maybe the, you know, one, two, three, here we go. Um, the Holy spirit really transformed that whole, that whole moment. Um, yeah. and even the repercussions of it. I actually wanted to go back. We're talking about some of the, I feel like right now we're talking about really, we've really like zoomed in on how to be good followers, right. Um, walking mm -hmm. in the spirit, knowing the Lord in those, uh, through the, those rhythms that you talk about, but I want to go back and, um, we talked about this before we came on, but how the public at large, um, how, how even the, okay, it, through, um, culture itself. And also through the Bible, we see how the type of followers we are really in some ways determine the type of leaders we have. And I thought this totally. was so interesting because you give some biblical examples. We can talk about those. Um, but you even give some quotes of some of our uh, nation's founding fathers about the importance of a virtuous citizen citizenry. Like, and if our citizens are not virtuous people, then the leadership we have over us will not be. I thought that was so fascinating. Can you guys maybe share about that? Maybe Rick will come to you. And I don't know if you wrote that chapter or not, but talk about, I think you mentioned Samuel um, was some uh, one of the biblical examples, but um, just share like how important being a good follower actually determines so much more than we think. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's just a, a lot of, you know, theologically, some of the observation that first triggered this on me was just reading some stuff with Calvin, where he's talking about, you know, why is it when God's the one who points out authorities, you get these terrible authorities? And he says, well, sometimes that's 
appointed as a judgment on you. In fact, that's a common thing in scripture. And you kind of, you read that and you're like, oh, dang. And as you (laughs) mentioned with Samuel and the people wanting, we want a king, we want a king. And God's like, okay, but that king will be a judgment upon you Mm -hmm. for rejecting me as your king. And it's like, oh, very similar things happen with, with Aaron um, and the nation of Israel, you know, Moses goes up the mountain there, sitting there with Aaron, and they say, hey, let's have a golden cow. And obviously Aaron had a failure of leadership in that moment. But it is interesting to read that passage of scripture because there's way more emphasis on the people rejecting God than there is on um, Aaron having been a, you know, lily-livered leader who wouldn't stand up mm-hmm. for the right cause. Um, and he doesn't get off the hook either. But the point is, there's a lot of that comes back on the people. And I was, you know, some of that was in my mind. And I was reading a batch of these quotes from Samuel Adams and John Adams and, you know, James Madison, all these, just a mass of these in our followers, our uh, founding fathers. And they just say, look, this, the form of government we're giving over to our, our progeny is a form of government that will only be able to lead a a virtuous people. And if you are not, Mm -hmm. the whole check and balance to bad leadership is put in the hands of the people for voting out those who are bad. And I've worried that we're now Christian and non-Christian alike are just saying, how can I vote for a person who will give me power, who will give me what I want Mm -hmm. and all those sorts of things. We don't particularly have a vision for the common good. I think we've disconnected to the intrinsic value of character on these things. We no longer ask, is our leader in some sense actually being the kind of follower he or she should be? We Mm. just have abandoned those causes. And Mm. we abandon them in little ways within our own areas of discipline. I mentioned in that chapter, you have a little section called bylaws are not bylaws. And, and <laughs> yes. there's all these things we build into our, our, the bylaws of an organization. And then when we get a good leader, we're just like, Hey, everything's going well. We'll just ignore them. And I'm like, Oh mm. no, those were there for a reason. And so the Ravi Zacharias and the Mark Driscoll, the Mark Driscoll example is really interesting because a huge thing that came out was uh, that a, a couple of elders basically got fired from being elders because of a contention over bylaws. Wow. And those bylaws were the exact things that would have put some of the constraints and modified some of the excesses of Driscoll's leadership. But, hmm. you know, those things Very are, important. are there are meant to be there for a reason. And we have a responsibility as followers. You have a whole uh, subtitle, see something, say something. Yeah. Um, that if we see something in our leaders, it's our job as followers um, to check that and, you know, uh, before it would cause uh, more destruction. Yeah. It, and it doesn't always work out. I see a note there in one of the, I think someone had sent in a question on YouTube, what happens when people don't listen? And and I, I'll be the first to say, look, people don't always listen. But mm-hmm. it's like so many other things where we're saying, look, I have to be responsible for my part of this. Mm-hmm. What people do with this I don't have control over. We can ratchet it up as we need to. In other words, there's people who say, wait a minute, that isn't right. And let me, you know, speak up about this. So I think, you know, the, hey, I said something once, so I'm backing off. That isn't really so much what I'm saying, but at some point you realize, okay, I I am not in control of everything, but I have to speak up. And sometimes those are things that also lead you to leave. Same way as, you know, an organization going, this isn't my mission, I need to go elsewhere. When you see, hey, this organization has departed from the mission, you probably have a similar obligation at that point. Say, okay, I may have to depart from that as well. That hopefully that that certainly shouldn't be the first choice, but it may be what what comes down the pipe at some point. Yeah, Courtney, I think you're talking, but you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I would say one of the context of him answering the the question that we got was, um, you know, you talk about followers needing to have wisdom to identify good leaders. So what happens when reports are ignored? You know, if so, if they are trying to point out bad leadership, yeah. and yeah, it's like what you said, Rick. I mean, sometimes it might mean a departure. It might mean a departure from the org. Oh, and like you said, that that shouldn't be your first go to you know, response, but that may be what ends up needing to happen, um, which is always really unfortunate. Um, Just the brokenness that exists in our world is just sometimes that happen. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, well, we're about to wrap up our time. I feel like it has flown by. Uh, I feel like we could keep talking for a long, much longer. <laughs> um, but Joanne, I'm going to direct this one to you first. And then Rick, I want to hear your answer as well. But we always like to um, kind of our last question in these interviews is we love to ask for a resource or a recommendation mm. that you have for men or women that are maybe in the marketplace. They want to learn more about followership. They want to follow well. Do you have a resource? It can be a book. It can be a pot. It can be anything. Um, anything that you want to recommend, <laughs> we want to hear about it. Okay. <laughs> Joanne, why don't you go first? Okay. Um, you're going to think, uh, okay. I'm going to say God's word. Mm, no, that's good. Because, because I don't think enough Christians are in God's word. Mm. And, you know, it's, uh, I'm going through the book, the book of Leviticus right now. And it is amazing. It's mm. simply amazing. And I know it's like, you know, avoid mm. that book at all costs, wow. but it, it, it is amazing. But so I would, I would say the book, uh, the book I would recommend is the Bible, but not just that. I would ask, ask this question as you read parts of uh, any part of scripture. And that is God, who are you? Hmm. Jesus, hmm. who are you? And what is your kingdom like? Hmm. Because that who the King is and who, and what the kingdom is like is what I, I want to, I, I want to follow. Right. So if we get it right from God's word, we're going to learn about his character. We're going to learn his attributes. Mm -hmm. We're going to learn about the power of the Holy Spirit who enables us to follow through with this. Mm -hmm. We're going to learn about Jesus who made the way. Um, and, and so that's, that would be my answer. Get into, his, in, get into God's word and ask God, who are you? Jesus, who are you? Mm -hmm. And what's your kingdom like? Mm -hmm. that's, that's really good. That's really good. Rick, what about you? One thing I'd point out about jo Joanne's comment about the word is the thing, just reinforce it. You guys already mentioned that that uh, she and, and you guys identified with it. Just thinking, what what does God have for me in this word? Mm -hmm. And, and you, you make the connection between your current life situation, what you're seeing in the word, because that was one of our worries as we were doing the soul rhythm. Jo Joanne largely wrote that section, but as we were talking about it, that was one of the things saying, we've got to act like God's really speaking to us in yes. the word mm -hmm. and embrace it. So I, I, I don't want anyone to hear what Joanne said. It's kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right answer. We're in Sunday school. It's the Bible or Jesus. This was the Bible one. Got it. Um, so having said that, on the other side, if you want to pick up other books and things like that, I'm the mundane guy. What can I say? Yeah. Um, there's a book called uh, Make Your Job a Calling okay. by Brian Dick and Ryan Duffy. And this is back to a question that was asked earlier about how do we help make our jobs meaningful? And I don't want to dodge that one. That's not a little question. And the uncanny thing is how often we are in a situation we can make a job more meaningful. And they do a wonderful job unpacking a bunch of, of that. So mm -hmm. uh, Make Your Job a Calling by Brian Dick and, and Ryan Duffy. And then similar Kingdom Calling by Amy Sherman. And I don't, you guys may have already done this because it should be for you guys yeah. a classic book. But it is a wonderful mm -hmm. book. And it partly casts a vision for seeing your work Christianly. <laughs> Uh, which mm -hmm. is my big thing about doing integration of faith and learning is literally seeing everything we do, every aspect of the created order, every sphere of human endeavor is a place in which we want, we want to enthrone Jesus as king. So mm -hmm. how do you do that with your workplace? And Amy's, Amy uh, Sherman's book is wonderful um, at, at kind of casting a vision for that and stimulating your thinking with that. So those would be two that come to mind. No, mm -hmm. thank you. That's perfect. That is perfect. Well, thank you guys again, just so much for coming on tonight. I feel like I'm, I have a lot to chew on even from the conversation, but um, more than anything, just really encouraged. You guys are doing really great work. And I think this book is so valuable. I cannot, uh, my husband's probably so tired of hearing me talk about it incessantly <laughs> because it's just like every chapter I'm like, my mind is blown. Um, so if you're listening to this and you haven't bought the book yet, we have a link on all of our social media. We have it on our website. It's on Amazon. It's everywhere. And you need to order it. <laughs> Don't wait another minute to purchase it. You definitely need to order it. So thank you guys so much. Thank you for writing it. I know that's a lot of work. Thank you for your diligence in that. And thanks for, for sharing with us tonight. Oh, You bet. Thank you for having us. It's a pleasure. It really is.
Thank yeah, you. I just echo what Courtney said, like, really, people, you need to get this book, um, because it's such a topic. We don't, we just, we haven't learned enough about it. And so um, I told them before that I'm just so grateful that they really created a new category in my mind, of how to think about um, just following the Lord. Um, so anyway, thank you guys. So before we jump off, I did want our listeners or viewers to know that um, if you love this conversation, if this is something that um, really is perking your interest and you're trying to figure out, oh, okay, well, how can my work really be meaningful to the kingdom of God? Um, we are thrilled to let you know that Women in Work has a book coming out ourselves. Um, it is set to be released on June 13th of 2023, coming out this summer. Um, it's called Women in Work, Bearing God's Image and Joining in His Mission Through Our Work. Um, we are going to hopefully drop the uh, pre-order link in the comments for us right now. And um, we have, it's a contributor book. We have 10 authors who have written on 10 various subjects of women and their work. Um, we're super proud of it and really asking the Holy Spirit to do what he will with it and hopefully bring a lot of fruit from it. Um, and also to piggyback on that, to sort of uh, whet your appetite for that, our spring season of the Women in Work podcast, which we're recording right now, is with each of our contributing authors. And so we're going to give you a little taste of what each chapter is about um, and I um, think you're going to be really encouraged by that. And as always, as you know, Women in Work is a 501c3 nonprofit, and to do all of the things we do, and um, hopefully it's a blessing to your life, um, we are always receiving your donations. If this is a, 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 an organization that you feel like is blessing you and um, has been meaningful to you, we would love to receive your financial support. You can find that at womenwork.net slash donate. So Rick and Joanne, again, such a pleasure. Courtney was so fun as always. Um, thank you again for coming on. I love this book. Grateful that you wrote it. Thank you. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much.